Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Smart Trucking Live. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Hamish Kay is here. George Wilson is here. Trucker Hershey, hello. Hazmat is here. Trucker Hershey says, um, Pride Trucking uh, filed for bankruptcy. Not the same one out of Salt Lake City. Not the one that, that we know and love. Just uh, just a cheap freight hauler out of, out of Brampton, Ontario here. Just proof that you can't run a thousand trucks on cheap freight and hope it all works out. So they're, they're no loss. They had a lot of trucks, but they just kept borrowing money and borrowing money and finally it caught up to them. Uh, what else is here? Yeah, Trucker Hershey, you're right. They, they did just buy up, um, an outfit out of Texas, I think that was like 800 trucks or something. So yeah, they, they, they grew a whole bunch and they thought they had, they had never ending funding from Mitsubishi Corp financial branch. Well, Mitsubishi decided that enough was enough, and that was the end of Pride Canada Trucking. So if they'd taken more pride in how they were running the trucking company, they might still be with us. But not a good job by those guys, but no big loss. Uh, howdy from Chile, Illinois. Alan, Alan Johnson, we had snow here today. In fact, it's still snowing here, so I sympathize with you on that. And George George Wilson's there in Illinois too, Montgomery, Illinois. Winter is back, yeah, yeah, here too. There was um, just a, a couple things in the news. But th- this is a Q and A, but before I get into that, I always like to talk about a couple of things that are current in uh, in trucking news this week. And I don't I don't see Muppet with us yet, but he would have appreciated this or understood this. But there's been a a major truck accident down in Australia involving a legendary trucker down there, a guy named Neville Mugridge, uh, like an old-time guy, 77 years old or something like that. He's had a a head-on collision with another truck out around Perth somewhere out in the outback and just just a devastating head-on with two trucks. Nobody survived, but this guy was a legend down in Australia, uh, like, like a trucking legend, so I'm sure guys like like Muppet will know and understand what they've lost with that. Nice, nice fella too. I'd heard him interviewed a couple of times. Nice old easygoing guy. And the other big piece of news in trucking this week is that FedEx has lost the the United States Postal Service contract to UPS, and that is that is huge because not only is that like a uh, how much is that like a one and a half billion dollar a year contract. It's gone from a non-union carrier to a unionized carrier, and which is very unusual because usually you win contracts by cutting costs, cutting costs. But here, the United States Postal Service has gone to a unionized carrier, and the union has been gaining strength with this with this new leader that they have. But man, that that is a big win for the Teamsters, and it's. It's curious to watch now the momentum that the Teamsters are, are gathering and wondering, you know, how much farther it will go because it could mean real changes in the trucking industry for the rest of us. Uh, what else do we got going here? Never buy someone else's trucks. You never know what corners they had cut in the end. That's true. You, ESPN 2022. If you can afford to buy new, always buy new in my opinion. I've only ever bought used trucks twice, and both times I knew the owner, and he had had it from new. I knew the history of the truck. I knew everything about the truck that there was to know mechanically, and that's the only time that that I ever bought used trucks when I knew those guys personally. But generally, when you see a truck, a used truck on the lot, it's because, especially these days, it's because someone's had trouble with it and traded it, and it's it's usually the emission systems that are the problem. So beware of used truck equipment these days. Hamish, coming in with a two pounds. Sorry, I just had to check the answer to your uh, question there. Uh, no, I double checked the email and there's nothing in there yet. Um, I'll put the email in chat there for you again, just to make sure you have the right address. Uh, try sending it again for us. Thank you so much for the two pounds, Hamish. Thank you, Hamish, appreciate it. Trucker Hershey, um, Pride owes over $600 million. Yeah, that's 
That's right, and that's that's what they know about so far. They just kept kept borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and hauling cheap freight, and and then you know they've had a freight recession here now in the last year, and it's it's caught up with them. So uh, it just comes to show how stupid people are. The seller must be thanking God and <laughs> running like a thief in the night with that money. Talking about a used truck, I'm sure. So Kelly Patterson, how are you doing, man? Anthony, glad to see you there. Z Bear, greetings from Addison, Illinois. John M, do not underestimate the power of the Teamsters to screw it up. <laughs> well, you never know how it's going to work out in the end. How come no one gives a shout out to Transex? I worked extra board for them back in 1994. A lot of air freight around O'Hare International Airport. That's funny you mentioned them. I worked for Transex for about six months. And I, I tried to make it work. I was an owner-operator, and I tried to make it work with them. And they had stuff going Western Canada. I was hoping to latch into some of that. And I don't know if they didn't like me or I just ended I ended up literally having to leave there because there was no freight. I was starving to death. So, But I was there for a little while. Z-Bear saw a brown 85 Kenworth 900 with a double bunk for 35000 was a farm truck from Oklahoma sold in an hour. I cried for two. I bet. You know what? I just saw online um, a kind of a backyard mechanic guy that just bought, but I think it was a 75 that he bought. But beautiful truck, but, man, needed a ton of work. It had an aluminum frame, which I am I am not a fan of. But, yeah, they're, they're really hard to find now, the old A models. Uh, uh, of course, 85, that would be a B model. So, uh, Anthony, good to see you too. Avin R, hey Dave, first time tuning into the live. Avin, glad you could join us, man. Appreciate you. Matt Mattel, good to see you, Dave. Hope you're doing good. We are doing good up here in spite of the, in spite of the snow. We know it won't last. So, Jose Carlos, hello from Brazil. Hello, Jose, how are you doing? Bitch, it's warmer there than here. Hello, brother truckers from Mud Trucking. <laughs> That's a cool name, Mud Trucking. Snowing here again in Wasilla, Alaska. That's from Jay. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's snowing there. Jay, you got Alaska gets like a beautiful summer, as I understand it. I've never been there. But I understand it's a beautiful summer, but it's like about six weeks long. So you kind of got to really appreciate it for when it happens. In Alaska... By, I had a friend that, that went to Alaska fairly regularly. He, he said it was just absolutely gorgeous. Gorgeous, gorgeous country. So, But it all, always a little too cold for me to want to explore. But Anyhow. So we're just, we're just throwing it out there today. Any, any questions you guys have? Be happy to field them for you. I've been, I've been following some other stuff here. I'd like to... I like to track the news, and it's it's interesting here about, I don't know how to say this. The FMCSA wants more and more and more electronic devices to control the trucks, and at the same time, the ATA now wants driver training, practical hands-on driver training, behind-the-wheel driver training eliminated. They want the new drivers to just come in and be able to do the do the written test, and then just be turned loose with the truck and just kind of learn on their own as they go. Horrifying experience, in my opinion. But that's, that's what they're pushing for now. And they wonder, they wonder why the accident rates go up every year. And they do. They're going up and up. They went up again last year. And, and this is the kind of kind of stuff they're doing. So Now, I just saw a question about cat engines, and I've lost it here. Where did that go? Which cat engine would you go with? 3406 series or the 6NZ? 6NZ was supposed to be the best of the best. So if you had your choice, um, go for the 6NZ. The 3406 often had head gasket issues, and the 6NZ was just a, just a stronger motor with, with fewer head gasket problems. It's, it was supposed to be the best engine that cat built before cat had to start getting into these emissions controls. But um, we 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 had uh, we had a couple actually six NZ motors. They were they were flawless, no trouble with them at all. Pulled like Jack the Bear. 
So 6NZ if you can find one, but they're they're in demand. Oh, here's here's steps. Hey man, how are you doing? Oh, <laughs> Mr. Funny comments about the mail contract. Finland is in the same latitude that Alaska is, and we get two and a half months of summer. I don't think Alaska gets gets nearly that for for some reason. Now I could have the wrong impression. I haven't been there. But uh, my buddy told me there that, that like to frequent Alaska, that it was about six weeks long here. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe everyone's got a different idea of what summer consists of. Dave, why is it that you have to have a clear driving record to drive truck? What's up with that? Insurance has a hold on the trucking industry. Does insurance ever have a hold on the trucking industry? And how? The, the long and the short of it is, most of the insurance industry does not even want to insure trucks because for various and sundry reasons. So they make it they make it as difficult as they can for trucking companies and truck drivers to get insurance. But no, they 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 don't want trucking companies as customers or truck drivers as customers. But it's a shame that our our system makes it mandatory for us to have insurance and and some provinces here solve that by offering government insurance, like Saskatchewan and Alberta do that, for instance. And that's that's the solution to being legal if you live somewhere like that. But it's, yeah, not being able to get insurance can shut trucking companies down, and it's happening a lot. They do have an, a hold on, on trucking. What are your thoughts on becoming an owner-operator in the tanker industry in Canada? Avin, I'm, I'm terrified for owner-operators anywhere right now, Avin. Um, I, I don't know that I'd recommend it. If, if you're going to do owner operator, or I did tanker and it was some of the best work I ever did as an owner operator. I quite liked it, but, but the trucking market is so iffy right now and, and Canada, it hasn't been great in a long time for, for freight rates and stuff. Tankers, tankers are better than most everybody off else off, but you're still controlled by, by huge groups that control the tanker companies. And like Shell, I remember a couple of years ago, I had a buddy that was pulling fuel for Shell through a carrier. So Shell decided they weren't going to pay empty miles. They were only going to pay loaded miles. But you can't, you can't backhaul anything once you've had gas in the tanker. Or if you do, you've got to go get a washout. And they're, you know, they're four or $500. Sometimes they can take a couple of days. So... Companies that haul gas, for instance, and diesel don't don't do that. They just run back empty, reload gas or diesel or whatever it is, and go again and go again. And Shell decided then that they weren't going to pay the empty miles for years. They've always paid the round trip, and trucking companies would quote them on the round trip. Now Shell came out and said, no, no more of that. We're just paying the loaded miles. And all sorts of trucking companies got hung out to dry, basically, because the rate got chopped in half. And Shell's a huge customer. There was nothing they could do about it. So, you know, it's it's a dirty industry anymore. And I, I, I think long and hard. I don't think I'd buy a truck in this market. But, you know, if, if you're well-connected, maybe it's a different story. But, uh, but I'm leery of owner-operator situations these days. What was your introduction to Zebra? What was your introduction to trucking when you started? I started bef- before I was 16 shunting trailers in a yard for uh, for Sears in the town where I lived. And it was, you know, I wasn't supposed to be really doing it, but nobody cared and they didn't really track that kind of stuff back then. And I just then, that was my first job was shunting, shunting trailers in a trailer yard and, or back and forth between the store across the street from the trailer yard. I never went very far, but that that was how I started. And I was always interested in it, and then I, I kind of went from there. But that was that was my my start with shunting trailers. Riverflow Trucking TV. Hello, everyone. Hello, Riverflow. Glad you could join us. 6NZ is a uniform, David. <laughs> I don't know if it's a uniform. I do know it's a cat engine. A guy from Canada says Alaska is too cold. <laughs> Depends on if you're from 
southern Ontario down here, it's quite a quite a temperature jump to go to Alaska. Unicorn six six N Z. Yes. Yeah, they are they are hard to find. I wish, you know, if I'd have known now what I knew then, or if I'd known then what I know now, I'd have probably worked harder at hanging on to at least one of my six N Z motors, but I, I didn't. I ended up I got I got an MBM engine, an M, MBN engine, which was the next one after 6NZ, and there's, there's hardly any difference, but there are a few slight differences. I still got that MBN motor, and it, it just it still runs like a charm. But it was, it's slightly detuned from the 6NZ to try to cut back the emissions. Now, now Caterpillar got fined for the MBN engine because it didn't meet their emission standards. It was still pumping out smoke. But I don't care. Hell of a good motor for me. Joel Start. Jenkins coming in with a tenor. Thank you very much for that. Hi, Dave from Pittsburgh. What effects do you think the Baytmore situation will have on trucking? The Baltimore situation, sorry. Oh, oh I think it's going to have, have huge ramifications. That's, that's a major north-south trucking corridor, that bridge. I've been across it more than a few times. But... It, it yeah it just you know not it's not just going to affect Baltimore it's going to affect everybody north and south of Baltimore too that was a major route and there's not a real good go around route like there's you know the decent routes are hundreds of miles around to, if you want to stay on highways so it's it's going to be huge that bridge they won't be able to fix it for months and months and months so major impact major impact I guess I guess the port that uh, specif specifies in or specializes in, in cars in and out, that, that port will be shut down for months. They're trying to find workarounds. They're, they're thinking Savannah is their best guess or best hope for a workaround situation for the automobile industry. But, but uh, it's a, yeah, it's a major disaster for trucking. Um, Starving owner-operator, how can I get loads? How can I get contracts with shippers without using a load broker? I'm flat better. Just just go to customers directly. You must be well aware of some of them. Some of them you'll have been sent to by load brokers, but I would try to stay right within your area, Daniel. We did a, we've got a video on this, actually. But it's just it's door-to-door -door work. Talk with the smaller guys, the guys that can you can relate to and you think will relate to you, and say, you know, just a local guy, honest as the day is long, better service than the mega carriers and f far better service than the load brokers and just go door to door and, and keep working the streets until you find one and you'll find one. And then when you do find one, just service the hell out of him. Do whatever he asks, do it as best you possibly can, service the hell out of him and, and he'll stick with you. That is, that is the best way. I've done that and it worked for me. So I, I'm sure it will work for you too. Dave, how do you keep your truck engine looking clean? Some say pressure washing can cause real damage. I don't pressure wash my motor. It's, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the spray, the degreaser that I use on my on my engine. I can't even recall the name of it now. But I just, I, I degrease it, and then I wash it off with a garden hose. And, you know, if it needs a little little work with a with a sponge or something like that or rag I do that as well but I don't use I'm afraid to use a pressure washer on it because you know you look at the the connections there for the ECM and stuff like that and you think man it, I wouldn't want water in any of that so but it's you know and the, mo the motors get hot and cold and hot and cold and eventually the paint will will flake off mine mine's experiencing that now but uh, all you can do is the best you can do but that you know that good quality greaser degreaser just use a regular garden hose, no pressure. Paul Hudson's here. Stabs, have your pressure washer at the lowest pressure setting. Stabs, good advice. Stabs, you are full of good advice. I got to talk to you more often because that's that's a really smart tip right there. Yeah, if if you run it at a low setting, you probably would be all right without blowing the paint off it. Uh, Dave, a yard jockey, Lord. Now, bear in mind, bear in mind, I was fifteen when I was doing this, fourteen or fifteen, I forget which, somewhere in there anyway. But I wasn't, you know, I never left their property, really, except for when I crossed the street. But it was, it was a good way to learn to back up. I'll tell you that. 
and those yards never had a whole lot of room. So it was it was a good place to learn. Hamish coming in with another five pounds. Thank you very much for that. Uh, yes, I always love answering this question. Uh, you should do a live stream of the American Trucking Simulator. <laughs> thanks for the thanks for the five Hamish the the live the American truck simulator is the bane of our existence it's we can't get it working and I don't think it's because Nick can't get just, it working just, just want to throw this in there the program works perfectly fine everything <laughs> works fine <laughs> the way the way we had it working though was it was for an automatic truck, and I wasn't used to an automatic truck, so I think that was a lot of the problem. It was pretty cool. I, I still, there we've still got it as here. well. Just to be clear, we set it for an, uh, automatic and manual. We did both ways, and uh, we're going to have to take another crack at it because I, what little we did play with it, I, I really did enjoy it. So we're go- we're going to have to have to get back at that. Simulator is for desk jockeys. I'm in for the lime. Oh, the Lettuce King has joined us. Lettuce King, how are you? I was, man, I was thinking about you today. Ed, and uh, last time we talked, you, you weren't even, you were, you were so busy, you didn't even really look forward to unwrapping the truck and getting it going this year. I haven't touched mine yet either. I still haven't got the batteries in it. Haven't, haven't done anything to it, but. Now the weather's no good again for a few weeks, so but you'll have to have to get your big ride fired up. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I got to come down there and for a visit here fairly soon. I want to see your new hot rod too. I want to see that. So glad you could join us there, Lettuce King. Uh, stabs. I have two thousand hours on American Truck Simulator. What's the main issues? <laughs> the main issues is that are that. On ours, the clutch doesn't work, or I can't get it to work, or something. So, uh, I, I don't know. We've, I don't know what the problem is. Again, everything works fine. It's just the driver. Just to be clear, my crew here thinks the problem is me. Oh, it's not the equipment. Oh, it's not the equipment. <laughs> uh, Quinn Taylor is Kelsey Trail a good company to drive for? I have been pulling trains for th- three years and want to run Canada. Kelsey Trail recently changed hands, and they they were a really good company to pull for. I have a friend that that pulled for them, in fact, but I don't know now how the new owner is. Uh, so I don't know recently how they are, but their history is excellent. They've been a great carrier for a long time. Good, keep keep nice equipment, good outfit. Check them out. Go go have a talk with them. Go have a look around. Do you think hauling milk is a good profession and is it possible to get a direct contract as an owner-operator? I have heard from people that do it that it is a good career. I don't know enough about it to know if whether or not you could get a direct contract, but I would certainly think so. I would certainly think so, especially if you live in a rural area and you know a few of those those guys, that, those dairy farmers. I'm I certainly think if if you know each other, they'd give you a crack at it. I I know it's it's pretty temperature sensitive business, but I think there's money in it. Oh, it the Lettuce King had his truck out last weekend. Oh, you're you're ahead of me. Oh, that must have been a cool ride. Did you enjoy it? I bet you enjoy, enjoyed it. And just just probably bobtailed, or did you take a trailer with you? Log Truck Life three seventeen. Hey Dave, how are you? I'm good. I'm good, man. How are you doing? Log log truck life. There's something I always wanted to try and never got a chance to try was was logging. But uh, I, I I ran it out in BC for about f- well about seven years all told. But I was doing all tanker and reefer work. I never I never got to try logging, but I always always wanted to. Where is a good place to get bobtail insurance in Canada? I the last time I had that was at 
Old Republic. I don't know if they still offer that or not, but I found them good to deal with. So try Old Republic. I had, I, I tried it with Markel, but didn't like them nearly as much as Old Republic. When are you moving to the States, Dave? <laughs> I, I, I was ready yesterday. I was ready three or four years ago. But uh, I'd, I'd love to live in Florida. I just can't afford to live in Florida, but... But uh, I'd I'd love to. Where was it? I was watching. I was watching a video today from guys that are just camping in uh, in Quartzsite, Arizona, in the Lettuce King. And I have talked about that specifically. He wanted to, wanted to try living out of out of his custom trailer in Quartzsite there. And you know, life being what it is, he had to set that plan back a little a little while. But no, I th- I was I quite enjoyed my time in the states. It felt more at home to me than Canada a lot of the time. So. I'd I'd like to do it again. Maybe the Lettuce King and I will wander down to Quartzsite one of these days. Did you ever run Mexico? No, I never did. The the Lettuce King and I got to sit in McAllen waiting for trailers to come come from Mexico, our trailers actually. But uh, no, never, never crossed the border into Mexico. Should your shocks be replaced every time you get new tires? In... Good question. In my opinion, you should probably replace your shocks. Well, look at your steering axle tires. How often do you replace them? I I used to replace my steering axle tires about 110,000 miles, and I would replace my steering axle shocks at the same time I did my steering axle tires. The the drives are a little bit different, especially if you're sitting on air ride. You you can probably go 200,000 on shocks for the back end because of the air ride, but keep an eye on them. And then, you know, if they start leaking or uh, they break or something like that, then absolutely replace them. And I replace them all. If I find w- a problem with one, I change them all. But it's it's good practice. It helps keep your, keep your tires in good shape. And it helps the ride, too. Woodpecker 82, freight brokers are evil. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> There's, there is a huge middleman group I cannot believe over the years how big that industry has gotten, the load broker industry, from, you know, just a few dozen. When I started, uh, there's thousands and thousands of them now. And all they, all they truly are is middlemen. All they do is take a piece of your freight rate for, for not a whole hell of a lot. So I, I think they should be outlawed. But I don't know. It's, it's not a concern of uh, the, the government, I guess. So they just... They just keep going and they just keep stealing. I'm a company driver. I use your videos as a training tool. Just wanted to say thanks for what you do. Captain 8002. Well, thank you, Captain. I, I appreciate that. Well, here's here's the Lettuce King. Had the reefer out. Uh, set the, uh, the high 12 land speed. <laughs> the high 12 land speed record <laughs> as, the, as the OPP. I hope not. I hope not. But it's, you know, it's hard to keep your foot out of it when you've got a large car like that, man. So if you weren't, if you were dragging the OPP along, I'm not surprised. The OPP is the Ontario Provincial Police for those that don't live here that don't know. But Log truck life. It's really fun going out in the woods and seeing all the wildlife and, and view it in the fall. I love, yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Love love wildlife and uh, Kathy and I still go for a morning coffee drive and we live you know in a small town in the woods and we just love seeing usually we just see deer occasionally we've seen a moose but love that stuff. Where do I live in Canada? Up in northern Ontario on Georgian Bay. Uh, my uncle hauls gasoline or diesel in Mexico. It's a lot of hills and mountain driving. He says. Uh, I, I I have been given to understand that Mexico has a lot of mountains and mountain driving. You wouldn't encounter snow in the hills, I wouldn't think. But mountains are mountains, no matter how you cut it. And if the highway's not well graded and well cut, that can be a real adventure. Could you recommend two reputable companies in Canada to work for that haul milk? Avin, let me get back to you on that. I, I don't know any off the top of my head, but I will I will get back to you on that because there are a couple. The, the one that I'm thinking of, the name escapes me, but... 
Amish coming in with another five pounds. Thank you very much for that. What are your thoughts on the International 9900i Eagle? Hamish, that's interesting you brought that up. There was a guy on the stream that last week at a, out of Manitoba, I believe, that asked me about the 9900i uh, Eagle. And I had to, I wasn't sure which model that was. I wasn't sure that wasn't the cab over, the one of the last cab overs that they made. So I went went and looked back. And no, it was the it was the, the big hood conventional international that they made. And it was, it was, it was a good truck. It the hood was awesome. The hood was like a huge boardroom table. I bro I drove one briefly, but amazing hood. I, I like a big hood. They had a huge hood, but they were a good truck. International made a really good truck. Inter International, like everybody else, ran into trouble when they the EPA got involved in making engines, and International made their own engines and hung on to their their SCR valve concept too long. And it damn near, damn near broke International there. They've recovered since, of course, but they made a really good truck. But the emissions rules just, like everybody else, just hurt them fiercely. <laughs> Staff's talking about running in the woods. It's fine until the food on four legs wants to have a go with a car or a truck. I don't know how it is there now, Stobbs, and... They've just kind of started running what we call moose bumpers here now. But uh, a, a deer strike generally on a, on a truck up here runs $25,000. A moose strike here, they write off the truck as a rule because it's, you know, the trucks are so fragile and the parts are so expensive. So a moose strike up, up here in Canada, generally they write off the truck. I'm worried about out here in California what trucking companies next to go out of business. To this week, white boy that I saw gone out of business. Out of Fontana, both of them. Freight haulers, mid-sized freight haulers. But it's, man, California is a tough trucking climate right now. And with, with everything else going on there, like the emissions and the traffic and the electric mandates on the ports and stuff like this, I, I know. I'd, I'd be worried too. I see I see people trucking people leaving California and going to greener pastures like like Texas and Arizona because everyone's worried about about how things are going to go in California in the next couple of years how things have already started first with the AB5 legislation and a lot of them left then and they continue to to trickle out of California it's 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 a worrying situation in that state Hey Muppet, I was just I was just hoping you'd join us there. You, we were just talking about a, uh, that big truck crash up outside of Perth. There, Neville Mugridge was killed. I imagine I imagine that you have heard of heard of him at least. Eh? Too bad, awful, awful looking collision. Yeah, three delivered, killed yesterday in a terrible. Oh yeah, if I if I'd have read farther, Muppet, I would have seen that. Yeah, but uh, sad. Eh? I guess he was a pretty good old guy too. Uh, but yeah, sorry, sorry to hear that. Awful pictures. Sergio, only two provinces have provincial police: Ontario and Quebec. I believe that's correct. Best international I drove was the big cab over bunk. Yeah, I liked. They had, they had nice cab overs too. They, they were good trucks. I learned my first truck that I learned in was a was an international Transtar. White boy, that's the yeah, out of California, but yeah, things are things are tough for trucking out there right now, and I don't I don't see an improvement on the horizon. Happily, you're not far from Arizona, and it's like night and day when you get in into Arizona. Dave, do you still run loads? No, I don't anymore. I I, I still have my truck, and I I joyride and and bobtail around in it, much like the Lettuce King does. Lettuce Lettuce King still has a reefer trailer. I've got a dry box, but I use it for storage, so I don't I don't drag it around. But uh, yeah, I still I still bobtail around for for fun in the good weather, and so you know I still like to I still like to drive the truck. It's a really nice truck to drive. It brings back memories. But no, I don't pull loads anymore. Stabs, we do run bull bo bull bars on most of the trucks. They usually take most of the impact, but usually only cosmetic damage to the truck. It's, you know, I, I think I think they're worth having. We always shied away from them because 
none of us like the look of them, but with the insurance the way it is now, it's becoming more and more practical to have them. We ca- we call them moose bumpers. You call them bull bars. I'm not sure what the what they call them down in the states, but yeah, and they're they're not cheap either. But the good ones aren't cheap. So oh, here's Muppet. My mate said the road is full of Indians, and they swerved towards you. Oh, oh, is that what happened to him? Oh, I'm so sorry. How to make sure a B-train tanker is not overweight. Scale it. Generally, if, if you're loading B-train tankers, they have discs. It's like if you open the dome at the top for the compartment, there'll be a rod with discs on it to mark different levels that the diesel or the gas or whatever it is should be in the tanker. And when tankers are new, the tanker companies run them to a government calibration center. So the government calibration center will fill each compartment with water and figure out the weights. It's it's a calculated process. It takes about a day for a set of B-trains for them to figure out, you know, how much liquid you can haul in each tank. And then they set these discs in the top accordingly. So you'll know what point to load to. Then you know. Then they'll tell you how many gallons or how many liters. They'll they'll tell you what it is to get to that level. And then these days with bottom loading, you just punch in those numbers into the loader and clip it into the bottom, and it will it will fill you up to the correct weights. But if if you're ever unsure, uh, go to a scale and check it. I had I had a buddy one morning that was half asleep and uh, he was he was in in the racks in Imperial Oil. In Calgary, loading. And diesel weighs more than gas. But for some reason, he was half asleep, and he punched in the volume numbers for the different compartments for gas when he was loading diesel. So he was he was way overweight. And by the time he figured it out, he was out of the refinery and, and halfway down to Fort McLeod, as it turned out. But uh, it, he, he managed to, to dodge the... The only scale that he had to, had to worry about, he managed to get by them down in Castlegar. But uh, he said it was a hell of a ride through the mountains being that heavy. I remember him telling me that story. Sergio, remind me where Perth is. If we're talking about Perth, Australia, where the where the truck wreck was, it's kind of up, up in the north. God, Muppet would be better at this than me. I want to say northeast corner, not not right to the, sh- the coast, but inland, northeast corner. But Muppet, Muppet can probably help me out with that. And if you're talking about Perth, Ontario, it's just outside of Ottawa, and there's nothing to see there. So, <laughs> was Canada affected by the Francis Key Scott Bridge crash? Only Cassius Bucket, only indirectly, only because you know guys coming in and out of Canada would would not be able to run directly up the eastern seaboard. Like if they had a load out of Florida going to Nova Scotia or something, that would affect them, and they'd have to find a different route. But mostly it would affect traffic into, uh, like, Philadelphia, New York City, New Jersey, that area. Or if you're running south down into the, you know, the coastal of the Carolinas, like Savannah or something like that. But And there's, you know, there's ways around it. But if you need to get to New York City, there's no real good way to get around it if you're coming up from Florida. Ah, David says they call them deer guards in the States. Okay, I knew there was a different name. <laughs> or a deer catcher. Thank you. Thank you. Stabs. We do have a Volvo straight truck that has taken a beating. First gets hit in the front corner by a reindeer in the north. Then the roof got hit and caved in, so we bought a new cab from Volvo. How did the roof get hit? Or did he flip one up onto the roof when he hit it? Because I've seen that happen. Are the Magnum more expensive than the than the herd moose bumpers? I like the Magnum uh, f- faster to operate. I don't know. I don't know which is more expensive. I've never. I've never really considered putting one on my truck, but. Uh, these these days, I probably should. 
Do you agree with the governed speed of 65 miles an hour BC is mandating tomorrow? I didn't know that BC was mandating that tomorrow. Considering, you know, considering the train in British Columbia, I, c- I can certainly see their point. It's not like they have any wide, flat, open spaces they can just let the thing go, you know. So in British Columbia, like I'm, I'm against, I, I, I think... The truck drivers should be in control of the truck, not electronics, not speed limiters, not, you know, automatic braking systems, not any of that stuff. But considering, A, the terrain in British Columbia, and and B, the type of drivers now that are in British Columbia, like I'm thinking about the crew that strikes bridges regularly down there, maybe it's maybe it's not a bad idea. So... Tough, tough thing, though. David Thomas from Ocala, Florida. Oh, I'm jealous. Perth, oh, I was lo- wrong. Muppets on it here. Perth is on the coast of Western Australia, about 300 kilometers from the bottom. So they're on Western Australia. Oh, God, I had the whole country mixed up. Thanks, Muppet. Appreciate that. Uh, Z-Bear, Dave, I'm asking because I'm starting end dump. Would you recommend double clutching or floating the gears while hauling loads? Wondering what you think since it's always, almost always 73,000 pounds. I always double clutch the thing. Like it, it takes no extra time. Depending on who you listen to, you're, you're saving the transmission or the engine or the drive gear or whatever. I was, I was a fan of double clutching. I know you can float it. I've floated them before myself. Just, I don't know. Why, 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 why take the chance? Experiment with it if you like, but I, I preferred using the clutch. Sergio, I hauled resin and bunker, so no dangerous goods. I forgot where Perth, Ontario was, but now I'm good. That was my route oh, many times. Oh, like towards going through the park probably to, to Ottawa or something like that, Sergio. That's the only, the only time I've ever been into Perth was a couple times when I, I ran through the park on Highway 60, I think. But not too often. I I didn't go into that direction very much at all. Did you haul livestock, horses? I went I went once with a friend of my father's, and he was pulling a bull rack, and that's the only time I've ever been in a truck pulling livestock. And I hated two things about it. Like I I really liked I really liked the lifestyle those guys have, but like it was out out west all the time but I found it hard to sleep when the girls were in the back rocking and rolling all night and, and mooing and the second thing was I didn't like washing out the trailer at the end of the load but uh, I think a lot of guys really enjoy it and make a good living at it BC doesn't want to do much about the wages for OTR nor do, do they want to do anything about the roads well BC BC isn't alone there T-Mucks I, I can't think of a state or province that is doing it right right now for either wages or or the roads. The, the, the roads in the states are becoming atrocious. And people down there, truck drivers that I, I talk to down there are saying, you know, we've spent billions in Ukraine and our roads are falling apart. So when our roads fall apart, our infrastructure falls apart, our supply chain falls apart, why don't they fix these roads and repair these roads? You know, and, and you know, if they'd been they've been paying attention on this bridge in Baltimore. If they'd done their homework and their due diligence, um, Pickle Park Pete there, the Secretary of Transportation, should have known that those piers for that bridge should have had concrete pillars around it, like a lot of bridges do to prevent ship strikes. None of that would have happened. That's that's the Secretary of Transportation. That's one of his jobs, but it doesn't seem like he does any of his jobs. So that could have been avoided. Yeah, Sergio says we run 105. Yeah, and there there are speed limiters for trucks in Ontario and Quebec for 105 kilometers. So we know we know here what that's like, and it's and it's here on on like on the 401, which is fairly major highway here. It is speed limiters are annoying because trucks can't pass each other, and it just it creates more of a traffic jam, and it creates more. 
road rage with the four-wheelers because they think the trucks are, are deliberately going slow in front of them. And it's not the case at all. But like here in Ontario and Quebec, I don't, I don't think they're a good idea. But, you know, nobody listens to me that works in Ottawa. So, uh, The longer it takes me to drive, the more I, I uh, get paid for hour by the hour, which is why you should all truck drivers should be paid by the hour. If they're going to set the rules like this and control you by the hour, they should pay you by the hour. You're controlled by the hours of service. So I think that's the best way to pay truck drivers if they ever, ever can get to that point. But they're not, you know, they're not interested in truck drivers making a fair wage. They're just interested in truck drivers keeping going for as little as possible. There's Florida Air Boater. When I started back in the late 70s, every, every terminal had top loading, and then a few years later they went to the bottom load. If you put... Where did that go now? Ah, now I've lost the comment halfway through, but he's talking about bottom loading, and you had to, you p- had to punch in the numbers. I, uh, when I started hauling tankers, it was, it was all top loading. And I was doing that in um, Edmonton, Alberta a fair bit. And, uh, man, up there in February with the wind just howling, I down near froze to death a couple of times top loading. Bottom loading, you know, you still had to stand outside and babysit the thing, but at least you didn't have to keep your hand on the, on the tiller to keep the fuel flowing in. But, uh, and I, I had some cold winters loading loading tankers up here i i don't imagine you got that cold in florida <laughs> oh here it is uh if you put too much in the computer it would probe out yeah and that, when we went to the bottom loading system here it would it would do that as well but one of the biggest problems we had now that you're talking about that was um you had to ground the trailer there was a plug that would ground the trailer and in the early days of the bottom loaders the ground plug didn't work half the time, and we learned <laughs> to bypass it with a paper clip just so you could get loaded, but then there was no automatic shutoff, so you had to be really careful. You punched in the right numbers so you didn't blow the roof out of the, out of the tanker. Uh, memories of fuel hauling. I remember being up there one time and, and laughing like a mad bucker because the guy beside me, we were top loading, and the guy beside me top loading had been so cold he was just all huddled up and he was sitting on the lever that made the fuel go go into the tank and he he overflowed the compartment it ran down the sides of the trailer and and we all thought that was really funny because there was no harm done except then they shut the refinery down because the fuel flowed underneath the trucks and then they were afraid to let us start the trucks and this wasn't a refinery that back then some of them required air start trucks but this wasn't one of those refineries. So we sat there for hours <laughs> waiting for them to clean up the fuel before we could leave. Uh, yeah, 60 goes all the way around Huntsville. Yeah, Sergio, that's where I latched into it coming out of Perry Sound here. Was, and I went into Huntsville, caught 60, ran through to Perth that way. Ham is coming in with another five pounds. Thank you very much for that. Dave, you should get a 379. Uh, sorry, you should keep your 379 and get a W900A as well. Uh, one for Catherine. And has, so she has one to drive in and get one for me as well. <laughs> if I could, if I could find, if I had a shop, first of all, if I had a shop and I could find a decent W9, I would love to do that. I'd have to drag the Lettuce King up here to do a lot of the work because he knows way more than I do about that stuff. I always. Always wanted one of those, though, and they were the only bad thing about them was they didn't turn very well. But God, it was it was amazing looking out over that hood. That hood was huge. There's just right near where I parked my Pete in the in the farmyard next door. There's um an old cab over Kenworth, and I think it's like a 1974. It's still got the Dayton wheels on it and stuff. It's all eaten out, and the guy there. I, I think he intends to rebuild it, but I, I look at it and think about that sometimes and think what a cool old truck that would be to drive. Uh, Muppet, Western Australia or Northern Territory base drivers don't have to fill out a logbook. The companies run on fatigue management management plans. 
How legal it is, I don't know. Oh, I hadn't heard that. That's pretty interesting. Hopefully a fatigue management plan means when the driver's tired, he can sleep, and when he's rested, he can wake up. But probably not. But that's that's the best fatigue management plan I could think of. But, but you know, interesting. I gather Muppet that there's just like no place to really, no truck stops, no nothing. They just kind of pull off the road and find a safe place and, and park it for the night. And I, I think that would be a fascinating way to live. But, uh, you know, a real... A real test to your character, I'm sure. As soon as the four-wheelers know your speed limit, what your speed limit is, they cut you off and brake check you. Some of them, some of them do that. I know they do, and I, I think some of them do it just for laughs. And it's, you know, if they knew what they were toying with, if they were new, you know, if they knew that maybe the driver wasn't paying attention and could just mow them right over with, you know, eighty thousand pounds with momentum or more. It's like a freight train, you know. It just does incredible damage if it's not stopped in time. So I, I, you, you just can't imagine how stupid some of these people are playing with big trucks. But people do it. Z-Bears, it's, I was thinking that too because the guy I, I was with said I'd wear the clutch out double clutch, and when he saw me double clutching, I just stayed quiet. <laughs> What the hell with him? If it's you know, talk to the guy that owns the truck. If he if he wants you to float it, go ahead. It's his truck, I guess. But whatever. You can't even find mechanics that can agree on this. You find some mechanics, and the the factory says that you should double clutch. The transmission manufacturer says you should double clutch. So, you know, I just I I listen to them, but all sorts of mechanics say, oh no, you don't need to do that. But you know, I can tell you from experience, and I've, I've driven a long time, but when you're floating, even the best of guys sometimes miss one when they're floating. And you can just hear hear the grinding and know that's not doing that training any good. David Thomas, Norfolk area has bad roads. Yeah, that whole eastern seaboard is just literally falling apart, isn't it, David? It's I, I quit trucking there because of the roads. One of the reasons, that the roads and the traffic. Yeah, speed limiters are dangerous on single-lane roads when overtaking. Exactly right. There, um, there are point-to-point -point cameras here, and usually you see the speeders stopping before the cameras because <laughs> they know where the cameras are. But, yeah. No, it, like on a two-lane road, a, sp a speed limiter is just downright dangerous. And up here in northern Ontario, that's what we have mostly is two-lane roads. So... George Wilson, do you or Kathy speak Parisian? No, no, neither one of us do. That's, that's mandatory in school here, and you have to take it till grade 10, I think it is. But no, neither, neither one of us retained it after we got past grade 10. No need for it. French, Parisian. I took it to grade 15. Oh, did you? Oh, Kathy's correcting me. And can you speak it? Well, Kathy says she can speak enough to get by, which I cannot, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> she says I can barely do English. Uh, Muppet. It's similar to a 14-hour logbook with one hour, one hour in 12 break, but you can't legally get fined for breaches as long as you have the plan tick, ticked off in the cab. Huh, so, yeah, as long as you've got a record of what your intention is. Huh, interesting system. Sergio, I was based in Edmonton for 10 years. I know it gets cold. I was working for S.O. Sharp Oilfield Services. Great experience. Did all kinds of hauling, loads of dynamite to Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories. That would be some trucking right there. That would be some trucking. I, I hauled, the first year I was with that tanker company, I was on the bottom of the seniority list, and they gave me all the, the crap loads. I used to go to, like, Fort McMurray into the oil rigs and stuff like that that I could get into, but uh, I didn't miss it. When I, I, I got higher up in seniority the next year, and then I just, I just ran uh, the Trans-Canada into British Columbia mostly. That was my favorite run. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I float something else in the cab and it's brisk. George Wilson. Uh, thank you for that. My boss always asks me why I don't float. It's Oh, it's been a, a controversy that's been going on for years. Sergio, I'm French, 100%. Learned English on the street. Huh. Oh, you're, you're a multi, multilingual guy. You're talented. I, I never, some people can grasp onto a second language just like that. I, I was never like that. I struggled with that all through French class. Carla, thank you. Carla, you're welcome. You're welcome. Happy, <laughs> happy to help you out there. Uh, what else do I know? All other states are governed by the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator and logbooks and ELD comply. It's, I don't know if they're doing the same to you in Australia, Muppet, but they're, they're trying to bring in the accident rate. I was talking about this earlier. The accident rate here goes up every year. And when they brought in the ELD in 2017, the electronic log, they said this is gonna, this is gonna make the road safer. It's gonna, we're gonna get to zero accidents. And I laughed because I knew that was no way gonna happen. But since the ELD, they've had more and more accidents every year. So now their argument is, oh, we need automatic braking and uh, speed limiters and stuff like that. The truth of the matter is, they need to do better driver training. That's the problem. The driving's getting worse. The traffic's worse than it's ever been. The roads are no hell anymore, but they're not training their drivers, and that's the biggest problem. It's, you know, you can have all the electronic crap you want, but if the guy driving the truck is no good, it's, it's going to crash. That's, that's as simple as that. Stabs. We got taught in the military that you float the Eatons in the Sisu trucks, but clutch the other synchronized trucks. Different, yeah, what different, different things work better on different equipment. Yeah, if it's, if it's a synchronized transmission, that's completely different too again, so. Yep, there's, I, I, I like to, I like to get to know the equipment. You can feel what the truck wants to do, and if you're doing a manual shifter, you can feel whether it's happy or not floating. And a lot of them want to, you know, they'll want to hang on to that gear, and you know the truck isn't happy about it. Why not why not just use the clutch and save yourself the trouble and, and maybe the embarrassment of having a grind? Also asked about the steering knob. He said he had one in his other truck, but he didn't know if they're legal or legal. No tickets yet, he said. I've I've been pulled over. I've I've run one religiously for years, one of those steering knobs on the wheel. Can't back up without it, frankly. But I've been pulled over maybe three or four times. And I've always said to the guy that pulled me over, the DOT guy that pulled me over, he said, show me in the book. Show me in the book where it says I can't have this. None of them have ever been able to find it for me. So as far as I know, it's legal. They don't like it, but there's nothing illegal about it. All right, chat. Well, that'll pretty much do it for us today. I just want to take a quick second to thank our donors for today, which were Hamish K. and Joel. So thank you to our donators and thank you to everyone else who came out this afternoon and participated in the chat. We apologize for not streaming yesterday. Our internet provider was had an outage yesterday, so we weren't able to stream, but we were today, thankfully. Um, so we might do another stream this weekend or early next week to kind of compensate for missing yesterday. Um, but look out in the community tab to see if we're going to be going live another day this week. Uh, other than that, if Dave has any announcements, now would be the time. My only announcement is make sure you watch our Friday video. It'll be up about 4 o'clock usually. Thank you all for joining us. Stay safe. Keep the rubber side down. Take care of yourself. Have a good weekend. Good night, everybody. <laughs>